This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Ed Fries published three games for the Atari 8-Bit computers which were published on cartridge by Romox, Sea Chase, Ant Eater, and Princess and Frog. His fourth game for Romox, Nitro, was unfinished because the company went out of business before Ed was done coding it. Years later, Ed became vice president of game publishing at Microsoft where he oversaw the creation of the Xbox. In 2010, Ed released Halo 2600, a demake of the Halo video game for the Atari 2600. In 2013, he coded an Atari 2600 version of Rally X. This interview took place on March 11th, 2021. After the interview, Ed sent me the assembly language source code to five of his games, which he graciously released as open source. You'll find the code for Sea Chase, Ant Eater, Princess and Frog, the unreleased game Nitro, and a chess game at GitHub. I know you've done lots of amazing things in your career with with, uh, Microsoft and Xbox and stuff, and we're not going to talk much about that. (laughs) I want to talk about the early stuff. (laughs) Sick of Um, talking about that stuff. Good. <laughs> uh, let's start before the beginning, um, kind of b- before your your Atari, and, and kind of warm me up with prehistory and how you got into computers, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so um, I grew up uh, in Bellevue, Washington, uh, which is a suburb of Seattle, and both my parents moved out here. They met in uh, Bucknell University, and they moved out here to Seattle to go work for Boeing. Um, my dad was an electrical engineer and my mom is a chemical engineer. And um, so I grew up in an engineering household. Um, and uh, when I was in sixth grade, my mom went back to uh, college and got a, a master's in computer science and started to work at DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, so it was kind of a cool place for a kind of techie, geeky kid to grow up because I had lots of, you know, I could go in my dad's uh, workshop and solder stuff together and try to make little electronic devices. And he'd bring home uh, programmable calculators, which then probably cost tens of thousands of dollars or something. And I could play Lunar Land around them and things like that. Nice. Um, at one point, we built a little kit, 6800-based hex keypad uh, microprocessor thing, and I did a little assembly language in that. Um, and my mom sometimes would bring, well, I remember going with her to the University of Washington when, and watching her submit her uh, batch jobs when she was getting uh, her, her master's in computer science. So she'd you'd have stacks of punch cards and then put them in a slot. And, You'd wait around for an hour or so and a printout would come out and you'd see if you made a mistake or not. So for some reason that got me interested in computers. (laughs) (laughs) The the delight of waiting by a slot for an hour. (laughs) Uh, Later, uh, later my mom would uh, bring home uh, either like a printing terminal sometimes, which is basically like a a keyboard attached to a printer and a modem. And so we could dial into her home back basically into her office computer at, at DEC and uh, play things like text adventures on, on those games worked really well on a pr- on a printing terminal because it would just you'd have the whole game kind of everything you typed you'd be able to see um, so yeah some you know somehow growing up around all that uh, rubbed off on me um, but I didn't really get going until um, you know the first personal computer started to to come out and so 1977, I would have been in, in junior high, um, started um, high school in 79. And uh, my high school had uh, Apple IIs. Um, so I was lucky about that. Um, and we were kind of the first set of people who at that school, We the year I started there was the first year they got Apple IIs in. And so we were kind of the kids who hung out in the computer room and learned how the computers worked. and played a lot of games like wizardry and uh, space eggs and <laughs> games maybe only old apple two people would know but sure <laughs> uh, um and then yeah i mean i'm just going to keep going if you unless you Please. have a question okay <laughs> uh we're, we're, we're almost up to the part that, that i think you were asking me about but um uh yeah so then um i found an atari 800 under the christmas tree one year um, and that was, it was gotta be 79 or 80. Could, it could have been as late as 80, but, um, 
was that a complete surprise to you or were you angling for a computer? I was probably angling for an Apple II. Yeah. And, and so I remember being um, excited, but also a little disappointed because it wasn't the machine that I, I, I wanted in a way. But, um, but then the more I got into the machine, the more I, I fell in love with it and felt like it was far superior to the Apple IIs I was playing with at school. So, um, uh, and then, yeah, I just kind of, you know, I was, I was going to high school, uh, working at a pizza place. I worked at a Shakey's Pizza at nights and on the weekends and, uh, and, and wrote video games. Um, uh, you know, basically, uh, yeah, I, you know, back then, of course, we had magazines. And so you could type in a game out of something like creative computing or something like that. And um, that was a good way to learn uh, kind of structure for how games work. Um, started writing my own games in basic and then when that wasn't fast enough transitioning into assembly language um, and the first assembly language game that I wrote was um, a space war uh, version of my own version of space war mm -hmm. was that uh, was a space combat yeah that's right I guess okay. I forgot what I called it but yeah that's right this is we're talking about 40 years ago so it's like yeah um, space combat, yeah. And so I submitted that to Atari Program Exchange. And um, it, what I remember is that it was rejected. And I remember it, it being unhappy because it was rejected. I remember me, you know, and just kind of moving on to this, to the next thing. Um, it's funny, I have that letter around here and I, you know, I looked at it not too long ago. And, and really, the, you know, it said that they liked the game and that there were, you know, like three things they wanted me to fix. And so I should, I should have just fixed those things and resubmitted it. But, you know, I was a high school kid. By then you were on to other things probably. I was on, I was on to other things, yeah. And the, and the other thing that I was on to was uh, making a Frogger clone uh, called Froggy. Um, and um, I mean, it was pretty straight up rip off of, of Frogger. Um, and um, that's how I got involved with Ramox, so. And I'll pause there and see if you want me to fill in. Sure. Well, let's start with, um, you said, oh, and I programmed my, program, my, my first game in assembly language, like it wasn't a big deal. I mean, most high school kids were using basic and, and happy with it. Um, what made you dive into the deep end with assembly language? Were you using the, the Atari assembler card or something fancier? Yeah, I started using the just the Atari uh, assembler cartridge. Um, there were a couple of reasons I wasn't particularly scared of assembly language. Uh, one is I had done a little bit on that little 6800 hex keypad thing uh, that I had to hand assemble into machine language, but I was just writing short um, things. Um, but I, I also had a thing uh, from Bell Labs called the Cardiac. And if you have never heard of Cardiac, you should look it up. It's a cardboard computer that one of my parents brought home um, and it's literally just like a, a folds open. It's made of cardboard. Uh, it actually comes as a little kit and you put it together, uh, which mostly involves folding and gluing card, cardboard. Um, and it has um, an area where you write in the uh, program in its assembly language. And then uh, you have a little bug. It's literally a little bug with a, that, that is your program counter and you move it from cell to cell. And then you pull these little levers on the bottom, you slide up and down and uh, let where you enter the op code that you read out of that location in memory. And then you just follow these little arrows that go around and the arrows will lead to text that tells you like, copy the value from the input tape into cell 35. And so then you do that and then you go to the, move the program counter forward and then you, you do what it says. And basically it, it teaches you pretty quickly that uh, computers are, are simple and not very smart and um, and they're not something that really need to be feared, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I got into um, relatively quickly, got into working in assembly language, 6502 assembly. And, um, and yeah, that was the way to go because then it opened up kind of all the capabilities of the Atari. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've heard of the Cardiac. I've never seen one. Um, it seems like part computer, part board game. <laughs> <laughs> World's slowest board game. You could look at it that way. Yeah. 
yeah, but if you want to know how a computer really works, it's just that simple. Hmm. So, um, all right. So you are doing uh, space combat, and you set that aside. You did your your froggy Frogger clone, and you said that's how the you got hooked up with the the Romox people. Um, can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, of course, that was the age of bulletin boards. There was no internet, uh, not a, at least not for normal people. Um, and so I was certainly connected to internet or connected to bulletin boards and I would upload stuff and download stuff. And um, somehow a copy of Froggy got away. Maybe I put it up or something or a friend of mine did, but, um, but it just had my name on it. It said by Eddie Freeze uh, on it. And it just, I guess, made its way from bulletin board to bulletin board until it got to California. And these guys were starting uh, this company called Ramox, and uh, they tracked me down. Which, I to this day, I have no idea how you would find, you know, in 1981 or whatever, a, a kid who's not even in the phone book. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just, and so I really do not know how they found me, <laughs> but some, but somehow they showed up one day, and uh, I, I think they may even have. I don't know if they called my parents' house or they showed up at where I worked or something. I, I honestly don't remember, but somehow these guys showed up and um, wanted to hire me to put my game on this new, um, you know, this new kind of, kind of system they were creating. Um, uh, and yeah, that was my start in the game business. They, they put a contract in front of me. It was like uh, no advance, 5% royalty. And I signed, you know, I was How like, generous yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah. I want to work in the game business. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being excited because they, they did send me a, a color TV. It was like nine inch color TV, but it was like, I had my, my own color TV um, to take to college. Uh, Cause that was kind of, I was graduating that year and, and heading off to college. Um, and uh yeah, I mean, the funny thing about that game was um, they were, you know, rightfully worried that we would be sued for the game that I had made. So they asked me to make a bunch of changes and um, they came up with the concept to give it a, a kind of a medieval theme. And um, so they wanted me to replace the cars with jousting knights and um, uh, basically make it a frog and princess sort of theme. So that became the game Princess and Frog. Um, I think it's funny if you're worried about being sued for copying Frogger that you still leave the frog in. But, <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> it's, it's a billion other animals you could have picked. <laughs> but they left the frog in. Apparently they weren't sued. It wasn't my problem. Um, so by then I was off in college and um, I, I went to a little school in New Mexico. So I, I flew down to the middle of nowhere in the desert in New Mexico went to a small small college there called New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. Um, and they, I went there because I wanted to get away from Seattle for a while. And um, because they had a, a strong computer science department, they had a lot of equipment and not very many students. So I felt like it was a place I'd have good access to computers, which I did. Um, unlike say the University of Washington at that time where people were standing in line to use a, a computer. Um, Anyway, so yeah, I went down there and, um, you know, um, I never met the Ramux guys again in person uh, after that first time. Um, uh, I was always talking to them on the phone. They were in California. They would send me little design documents, which were basically like a single page hand, hand drawn of what they wanted me to do. Um, and I just kind of remember it as like every other relationship I've ever had with when I've been a programmer on a project where there's somebody, I'm trying to meet somebody's spec and there's compromise and you're arguing a back and forth about, you know, yes, I can do this. No, I can't do that. Um, but we would just do it over the telephone and um, I would send them builds periodically and get their feedback and uh, we got to the point where they could, they were happy with it. And then they published uh, princess and frog. Um, and it wasn't that long after that, that I got my first royalty check. And it was like, it was significant for me. It was actually quite significant. It was something maybe $7,000 or something, Wow. which um, was like my tuition plus my room and board or something, you know, I mean, 
So sure. it may have been a crappy deal, but for me, it was actually, it was, it was meaningful money at college. Um, and uh, started on, um, started working on the next game, um, which was called Sea Chase. Um, but I'll, I'll pause here if you have any other questions. I just want to point out that if you had stuck with APX, they paid 10% royalties. So you could have made twice as much. <laughs> twice as much. I know, I know. And all I had to do was like fix a few bugs. Could have put out the, space combat. The, the, the low royalty amount just like galls me every time I hear these numbers, you know, <laughs> for years. It's like, come on. I mean, I, I realize they had a lot of costs too and distribution and all that, but still. Just well, you know, I ran Microsoft's game publishing business later in my life, you yeah. know, and so I, I, I made a bunch of those deals from sitting on the other side of the table and I, I never made one as bad as I, as I signed. So I felt like <laughs> it's like I could feel good about the deals I was making. But anyway, um, yeah, so uh, went on to do Sea Chase. Uh, uh, I... By then I knew uh, the machine better. Um, I was getting a little better at making games, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, oh wait, uh, I'm sorry. I have the order wrong. I did Anteater next, right? Yeah, I did Anteater and then Sea Chase. Okay, sorry, I, I gotta get the order right. Somebody's gonna correct me. Yeah, again, this <laughs> You're gonna is get like, well actually done your own life by nerds on the internet. <laughs> exactly, exactly, 40 years ago. I'm pretty sure I did Anteater second. Um, and uh, that's probably the game that the most that people say, oh, I played that game. And then I ask them questions and it's usually a different anteater, but a few <laughs> of them actually had played my version of anteater. Um, and again, this was something that came just with a, a they, they sent me just like a one page hand drawn thing. It was clearly, I mean, I could tell it was meant to be a Dig Dug clone, but um, disguised with ants and uh, anteaters. Um, and, um, but it had some things that were unique. You had to go up, basically you, you tunneled your way up, dig dug style to the surface, picked up sugar cubes and one by one, you'd take them back to your den. And um, it, ha it, it kind of worked out nice because each time you went up, uh, you know, you'd be making new tunnels, then that opened it up and made it easier for the ant eaters to attack you. Um, and so you're dodging the ant eaters, and you could drop rocks on them, dig dug style. Um, but you didn't have you didn't have a weapon like in in dig dug. You couldn't like you know attack them. Um, so it was mostly about avoiding them while you're trying to move these sugar cubes from the top to the bottom. Um, and it turned out okay. I think it played pretty well. I, I um, you know um, and so by then I was probably you know finishing my freshman year, getting into my sophomore year, it would have been around 1983. Um, and then I did this third game, Sea Chase, which I think, yeah, was probably technically the best of them as far as just looking better. We, we, uh, both Froggy and Princess and Frog kind of suffered from me not understanding how the dis how display list interrupts worked. Mm -hmm. And so it can be kind of janky. You can kind of get these kind of uh, tearing uh, when you update the screen, the, when you're scrolling while it's visible on the screen. Um, and um, for those later two games, I, I, I figured out how to use display list interrupts and, and made the games look better and, and play better. Were you um, reading like De Ray Atari to get this information or? Yeah, I, you know, I had De Ray Atari and that was like it, you know, it's, it's funny to think of now how much we can go on the internet and we can, you know, even download source code and look at it and, and interact with other people. I had none, none, none of that, you know, I had a few books and, you know, my imagination and, um, and that was really, that was really it. Um, there weren't, there weren't other Atari programmers I was in touch with or, or anything like that. Um, and um, meanwhile, Ramux took those games that I made and ported them to some other platforms, um, which was fine. Um, I, I don't remember what the financial deal was on that, um, if, if any. But <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, that, so then I made Sea Chase. And, um, and then I started to work on a fourth game called Nitro. And uh, I don't know if that game would have been fun or not. It, it had to do, there were like these 
it wasn't it wasn't really a game like sea chase was an original concept they had it wasn't like a copy of a um an arcade game at all um but um uh, nitro there were these uh, little bulldozers that would push explosives off and the off these platforms and they would fall to the bottom and kind of land on this teeter-totter and you were you were trying to like keep the teeter-totter balanced because if it pushed too, if it got too weighted on one side or the other, it would it would lean and, and push down a plunger and that would set off all the TNT and blow everything up. Um, yeah, I didn't get far enough in the in the game to decide whether it was fun or not, um, but I you know got the rough draft kind of put together. But what what happened is basically just Ramax went away. I mean, now we're getting into the crash of 83, 84. And um, I mean, at some point, I think they just stopped answering the phone. Um, and I didn't, it, there wasn't like someone called me and said, you know, it's over. It just became obvious that it was over. You know? um, and so, yeah, then I had to get a real job and I went to work for the computer center. <laughs> hmm. um so okay, the, the other students at, at at your at your college, I mean, they're you're in the in the computer department. Did they have their own machines? Were they was everyone hustling like this, or were you an outlier in uh, making money? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there was a there was a kid down the hall who later was my roommate for a little while who had an Apple III, but he was he would just use it to play games or do schoolwork. I, I didn't know anyone who was um, who was had paid jobs programming basically mm -hmm. um no i think it was just me you said uh, some years ago in another interview um about nitro you said i probably have a build floppy i should dig up one of these days have you dug it up um yeah i did i transferred it over um uh, but i don't think i've tried to get it to run um but yeah, I have, I think I have it actually on this laptop that I'm talking on right now. Um, so I, I could probably share it with somebody if they really wanted to try to get it to work. Again. I'm sure there are people in the Atari community who would love to uh, find the, the play the missing Ed Freeze un unfinished, unreleased game. I, I fear they will be very disappointed once I get <laughs> it up because it's going to be a very early, very rough thing that won't, won't be fun. Do you have but, the source um, for, for I'm, I'm sorry, uh, do you have the source for the, the other games? I think I have it, I think, yeah. Basically what happened was I had a set of floppies. I copied them off several years ago, um, but then I, I haven't done anything else with them. But what I remember was having, I would use both sides of the floppy and I remember having trouble reading the back sides, um, that the front sides were okay, but the back sides weren't. But I think I had everything backed up enough that I could get at least the stuff that I had made. Great. So I do think I have it, yeah. Well, if you'd be willing to share it, I'm sure that uh, people would love to see that. Um, all right, so Ramox disappeared off the face of the planet. Um, and let's see, I have a couple of other notes here. You did something, some sort of robot war game, I think on your own, and some sort of gin rummy game. Yeah. Um, Anything to say about those? Um, so those were basic games that I was doing before um, I started to write an assembly. Um, and um, they were just things I wrote for fun for my with my friends. I had a, a group of friends that we would, we were big card players. So uh, Gin Rummy was, it seemed like the simplest card game I could try to write a program for. So um, I, I did write a Gin Rummy game, um, which was called Comp UFO. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, the uh, the robot war game was interesting. Uh, also written in Atari Basic, um, you would um, you could program these little robots uh, with their own assembly assembly language effectively, and the uh, um, the code would uh, you know the basic code would execute the basic program would execute the code on each of the robots on each clock on each each turn basically it would execute a turn let each robot execute an instruction and the instruction might move the robot or turn its turret or shoot its gun or that kind of thing 
and the robots could shoot um, missiles that would um, go across the play area and then and then they would explode in a certain radius and then um, disappear again. And um, we had a lot of fun, my friends and I, at least I had a lot of fun because uh, of course I had an advantage having written the program. I had a lot of fun, fun beating up their robots, but um, but there were you know a lot of different strategies. You'd, you'd, you'd put the robot out and you'd try to, maybe you'd make some code to try to lead another robot, you know? So you like take samples of where you could see it out where it was. And then you try to shoot a shot that leads it and you know predicts where it's gonna be by the time your missile gets there and explodes, something like that. One of the robots that I did that really stands out uh, in my mind was called Miner. Um, and you know, Atari had a, like a high, re you could have a high res graphics mode on the top part of the screen with like maybe like a four line text window on the bottom. And that, that, that's what this used. So in the text area, it would give updates on what's happening in the game. And in the upper area, there was like a, a thick wall around the play field. And, um, and so, but the wall was, uh, you could blow it up. If you, you know, shot a missile into the wall, it would make a hole in the wall. And so Miner's whole strategy was to go over to the left edge and then start shooting down to the bottom until it blew a hole through the bottom. And then it would go and hide under the text area for a while while the other robots fought. And then, and then eventually it would blow another hole on the far side and pop back up and then try to finish off whoever was left. Um, so, you know, robots could be somewhat sophisticated in this game <laughs> in what the things that they did. Nice. That's really yeah. clever. So was this, was it sort of like a, a batch processing thing where you like submit the code for your, everyone would submit their code to their robots and then they would fight it out and you, but you're out of your hands at that point? Exactly. Once you started, it was all just up to the, what the robots did. Yeah. And they would start in random locations. And so their, their programs had to be able to handle that, but they weren't that easy to program. I mean, you had to understand this assembly like uh, language and be able to write stuff in it. Um, it sounds like structure. actually sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good games should sound like fun. It does sound like when fun. they're described. Uh, does that still exist? It might. It might exist on my floppies. I I, I should I should look for that too. Um, that would be fun if people wanted to go write more robots. <laughs> right. Um. Cool. So. I think that's it for the Atari stuff. Am, am I am I right? Any other? Yeah, I mean, unless you're going to fast forward all the way to Halo 2600. Well, 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 yeah, we'll do all a second. <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, yeah. any other uh, uh, Atari fun back in, in, in those days? Did you you play any games? Did you get online? Did you, you know? Yeah, I did all that stuff. Uh, at one point, I got into breaking copy protection. This was before I was professionally making games. So uh, uh, it was somehow I got hooked up with some shady guy and he would like bring me games and I would um, I would take the copy protection out of them and give them back to him. Nice. Games <laughs> on, on disc or cartridge? On, on disc. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And uh, I don't I don't know why my parents let me hang out with some guy. Who, but anyway, <laughs> for, for me, it was like a source of new games coming in, you know, it was like. <laughs> The cost was that I just had to figure out, you know, in the assembly language where the where the copy protection was and remove it. Mm -hmm. And I remember the the protections getting more and more sophisticated to the point that they got quite hard for me to do. Quite like ones I, where I gave up, you know. But by then I was working on other stuff. It wasn't it wasn't fun once it got really hard. I mean the programs would encrypt themselves based using parts of the code that. Um, the, the code that you want to change is used as the key to unencrypt the rest of the program. So if you change that code, then it, it, you can't unencrypt the rest of the program to execute it. And it, it was, there were, I was battling clever people. <laughs> and, and for what reason? Just for fun, basically. So, yeah. Nice. That's, that's kind I, of awesome. I, I remember there being a, a pirate bulletin board that was just one of the bulletin boards I would go on. And, and then at some point somebody realized I was also a writer of games. And then they thought I was like a spy on this pirate bulletin board. I remember being accused of 
being a spy or something, which was not true, but, <laughs> but anyway. Drama. <laughs> drama, exactly. They're drama. As long as people could get together, there's drama. Even when it, yeah. I'm wondering if if your your time defeating copy protection on the Atari, if that knowledge or any of that came useful later when you were working on Xbox. Oh, on Xbox. <laughs> I mean, just like this, in, something about being in the mentality of, of crackers, you know? know. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe it just makes me more sympathetic to them. I don't know. Um, I... Um, for me, it was a technical challenge, and I think that's probably true of people who do it today. Um, and you know, I probably wasn't thinking as hard as I should have the, about the ethical implications of what I was doing. <laughs> um, you know, as far as Xbox goes, um, that project was super rushed, and um, you know, my job was to focus on producing the first-party games for it. So I wasn't super involved in the uh, encryption part of the Xbox. But what I do remember about it was um, that that um, the uh, the hardware team who had put in kind of this hardware level encryption, at one point they um, to test what they had done, they gave it to another part of Microsoft where there were these um, Eastern European hacker guys. <laughs> that works for some part of Microsoft. Um, I never asked too many questions about what their real job was or what, you know, why, why we employed them. But I remember them hacking the Xbox quite quickly, like 36 hours or something like that. And so, you know, you know, later after we shipped, some guy wrote a whole book about breaking the Xbox and what he did. Well, he did it, these guys did it in a few, you know, in less than two days, if I remember right. So, um, so we we knew it was going to happen. I guess I'll say. Sure. We, we weren't surprised when it when we when it came out and it got broken. You have a blog, which you haven't updated in a while. Um, but man, it's going to feel with, guilty. <laughs> no, 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 no. We that's, but I'm. It's filled with fascinating stuff about uh, finding the, the first arcade game ROM and 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 uh, trying to find the, one of the first Easter eggs and um, so it seems like you're you're still having fun digging into old code. Yeah, I am really. And um, a couple of things have happened. So in the last two years, um, I started a venture fund. And uh, when, you're, when you're running a venture fund, at least when you're raising money for a venture fund, there's rules about uh, how public you can be about stuff. Um, and so um, that's my excuse for not <laughs> updating my blog as much as I should, <laughs> although it's a pretty weak excuse. Um, I, um, you know, one of, the, one of my recent restorations is this game Quack, which is uh, the first game with a light gun. Um, and I really should write about this game. It's pretty, pretty interesting game. It has some interesting firsts, but here you can see um, Grand Track 10 and that I wrote about on the blog. This is a, a gotcha that I, I got a hold of recently and it's in the middle of being restored. So I'm, uh, I'm working with a, one of my old high school buddies on uh, redoing the cabinet for that. Um, and I could turn that into a color gotcha, which none of those exist in the world as far as anyone knows. Um, but I but I wrote about color gotcha in one of those articles. So maybe I'll make it a, a color gotcha. I have the right printed circuit board to make it a color gotcha, um, but I have I don't have the right TV. Um, but but I'm but lately I've been distracted by other cool fun projects. So. Um, I, I won't turn the camera that way, but over on that corner of my, my workshop here, um, I have a PDP-8. Um, it's, a, it's a PDP-8L, which is a 4K uh, PDP-8 uh, from 1968. And uh, it, I got it just as the pandemic was happening. So that was awesome because I was gonna be like locked in for months and have all this time to work on that. Um, so um, I wanted to get a version of, of Space War running on it. And it turns out that the, the most, the, the best implementation of Space War on the PDP-8, uh, it was 6K. So I had, to, I had to make it run in 4K. Um, and so I got to learn PDP-8 assembly language, which was really shocking, actually. 
<laughs> so I encourage people to go and look. You can just look in the Wikipedia article about about the PDP-8, but it, um, it only has three bits for uh, opcode. So that means you can only have eight opcodes total. And so they do everything they can to like combine opcodes together. You know, so like there's no way to load an instruction, load a value from memory into the one register. Um, there's no load instruction. Now, th there is an add instruction. So you can add, but you, you better make sure that the register is zero before you add to it if you want to load a value. <laughs> um, and to make that second part easy, there's, there's um, you can store from the register to memory, but the store clears the register. So that makes it easier sometimes, but it's not, it's kind of annoying if you're like trying to save a value off like a temporary copy of a value. You've got to read it back again immediately. You, you gotta, you gotta add it back in again. Mm. Yeah, so um, it doesn't have bitwise operators other than and, which kind of surprised me you could even live without that. But so it doesn't have an or instruction. It doesn't have an XOR instruction. Um, you have, if you want, if you want those, normally you can, if you know what you're doing with an and and an add, you can get away with that, add an or, but an XOR, yet you basically have to write a little routine to do it. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, it's really, there's a million other things that are crazy about it. It, it, it can only access 128 bytes uh, around in these little windows. And so you're, you're constantly keeping things in little 128 byte windows as you work on it. Um, but, um, but yeah, I managed to do it, get sp space we're running down in a little, um, in, in 4k and I built a little, um, the only way I could get data out of it was through a serial port. So I, I built a little Arduino, uh, that reads the, I, I basically had the program send out the XY coordinates of, of everything it wants to draw. And then I have a little Arduino that, um, is hooked up to, uh, an oscilloscope basically. And in X, Y mode, and then it plots the points. And, and yeah, you've got the two spaceships and they can rotate and fire at each other and it all works and it's space war. Um, so did that and then that got me into, uh, I got a PDP-11. And so now I've been learning about the PDP-11 and, and uh, getting my PDP-11 up and running and playing uh, some of the really early versions of Rogue, uh, which is another really um, important kind of game in the history of the game business. So. Sure. So I really, um, I, I'm really bad about, I should, I should have written more, I should have written at all about, about the Space War project. And, um, and I should also write about Rogue, uh, but at least Rogue is actually reasonably well documented online. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing, constantly doing goofy stuff. That's amazing. Cool. And what, uh, what long we're talking about, what do you do for real life or just is goofy stuff all the time? Yeah, no, no, no. My real, my real job is I run a, a venture fund uh, that invests in, in small game developers. Uh, my venture fund is called One Up Ventures. Um, and we invest in little game developers around the world. Um, and that definitely, that definitely takes my time. Sure. That's, my, that's my real job. Nice. So what, what inspired you to uh, demake Halo for the Atari 2600? Yeah, so I was given a talk at a game conference, uh, I think in Philadelphia in, in 2009. And uh, I often, when I get talk, I'll talk about my history in the game business and I'll, maybe I'll show a picture of Froggy or something like that, you know, um, something from the early days that got me going in games. And uh, afterwards, somebody came up to me and said, uh, asked me if I had seen this book called Racing the Beam. Um, and I, I hadn't, they took, he told me it was about the Atari 2600. And so anyway, I was like, great. I went home and got the book and, and, and read it. And it's, it's a fascinating book. I encourage any Atari people to read it. Um, and, you know, it got the programmer in me, you know, this is many years later, <laughs> you know, I hadn't done 6502 assembly in at least 20 years, you know, it got me wondering maybe I could, uh, work on this machine or what would it be like to work on? I mean, I, I always kind of assumed the 2600 was kind of like a miniature version of the uh, Atari 800, which is sort of true, but it's so much, so much worse. I mean, almost unimaginably worse. 
um, you know, like um, there's only 128 bytes of RAM total. That's like a, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Atari 800 has, tip, you know, if you have it fully loaded, it's 48,000 bytes of RAM. So 128 bytes versus 48,000, that's a big difference. You know, um, the maximum program size without doing something weird like bank switching is, is 4K. So you've got 4K of ROM, 128 bytes of RAM. Um, and the, but the really shocking part is not having display memory. Um, and that's where the title for Racing the Beam comes from, you know. And any computer kind of since the, you know, 2600, if you wanted to put a pixel on the screen, you write a bit into a certain location in memory. And if you stick the bit in the right spot, it's going to make a dot on the screen. Right, not on the, the, I mean, the 2600, you only have 128 bytes of memory. That's not enough to even do like, you know, a line on the screen, much less, you know, one line of bits, much less the whole, the whole screen. So how do they, you know, so the question with the 2600 first is like, how does this machine even work? How is it even possible to make a game on this machine? And that's, you know, the book does a great job of explaining it. So I'll just let, tell people to read the book, but, but I, I read the book and it made me think, well, maybe it would be fun to at least, maybe I could at least get something to show up on the screen. Let's see how hard that is to do. And so I started to look online and I found, oh, there's this Stella emulator debugger thing. And oh, this is actually pretty slick. And there's people making games for this system. And um, so I, you know, I'm like, well, what, what do I do? Um, I'm like, I'm just gonna, see if I can put a picture of the master chief on my on my screen. The first thing I thought of. So I pulled up Microsoft Paint and drew a little master chief, you know. Um, and uh, you know, just like I used to do in the old days, convert that into hex and then and then you know write the code to try to get it to to show on the screen. And that probably took a week to get my little master chief on the screen. And then once I had him on the screen, I was like, okay, well maybe I could uh, move them around. And so then I put in some code so I could drive them around the screen and add, you know, add a couple frames of animation, you know, two, uh, two animation frames and just, <laughs> I don't exaggerate. Um, and, um, you know, then I could drive him around and then, uh, you know, and, you know, at this point, you know, like a month or two is going by and I'm just playing with this, you know, on the side. And then it's like, okay, uh, I need to give him a an enemy. So then I put a little, a grunt on the screen and then you know I made it so I could shoot at them and they could shoot back at me um, and that was it it was just like on one screen like one enemy master chief could shoot they could shoot um, and uh, so then I went off to game developers conference so this was in March of 2010 and um, I was walking around the expo area of the conference and I saw some people I knew and I walked to, up to them. They were with some people that I didn't know. Uh, and it turned out the people I didn't know there, uh, there were people like Ian Bogos, the, the author of <laughs> Racing the Racing Beam. The Beam. Uh, <laughs> there was Todd Fry, the guy who did uh, Atari 2600 Pac-Man. Pac mm -hmm. um, and a guy named Mike Micah, who uh, does a bunch of retro stuff, Other Ocean. Um, uh, less of an Atari guy, but a, a retro guy in general. Um, and uh, Chris Charla, who's kind of a, a guy who works at Microsoft Games Group, but does a lot of, writes some about unusual games and uh, is a game collector and that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so I run into these guys and they're introducing me to, oh, this is Todd Fry, worked on 2600. This is, you know, Ian Bogus. I'm like, oh, I just, I just read your book. You know, I was like, I'm actually, I'm working on uh, the, uh, 2600 now. I've been, I've just been dorking around with it. And, and, uh, and they're like, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, you know, I'm just, you know, I just put like the master chief up from, you know, Halo and I just like can drive it around the screen. And they're like, they're like, you're making Halo for the Atari 2600. And I'm like, no, I'm not making Halo for the Twisting. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just playing around. I'm just like, I wanted to see what it would be like to be a Atari 2600 programmer. Like if I was born a few years earlier, maybe I would have done that, you know, instead of worked on the 800. And they're like, they're like, they're like, no, you gotta, you gotta do this. And I'm like, I gotta do what? And they're like, you gotta finish this game. And I'm like, I do. And they're like, yeah, you have to make Halo 2600. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, it's like moral imperative or something, you know? 
you know, and so then I, you know, made up every excuse I could think of like, well, I'm not really good at drawing the sprites. And they're like, oh, we'll draw your sprites for you. And then I'm like, well, you know, and I, who's going to help me test it? And they're like, we'll be your beta testers, you know, send us copies, we'll test it. Um, so I went back from GDC with this mission to actually build Halo 2600. And, um, and I had a support crew, you know, <laughs> like Micah did some sprites for me, redrew my tree to make it look less bad and a few other things. And, uh, um, you know, Ian Bogost was a tester for me. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's when the real work began because I, I set the goal to have it ready for, um, for Classic Gaming Expo um in uh july of that year and uh it was a lot of work to get from just like this little demo to actually building a full game with 64 rooms you could battle through and a boss encounter at the end and and everything else um and do it all in 4k hand assembly and you know when i got near the end i was you know i was out of ram i was out of rom I still had bugs, you know, I had to, so every time you got to fix something, you got to read back through the code and try to find a few more bytes from a routine. You've probably been through three or four times before to try to find a few more bytes and just keep squishing it down and, and, and squeezing in the last few things that you can squeeze in. And, um, but yeah, I got it done and we shipped it, uh, through Atari age, um, at uh, classic gaming expo and, uh, yeah, it was super fun. <laughs> that's awesome very cool um and you did another tw oh hold on how did how did that end up in the in the permanent collection of the smithsonian american art museum <laughs> well isn't that obvious how you would go from one to the other i'm not making the mental leap i need your help <laughs> yeah it's pretty strange actually um so so basically what happened was um uh, i had a friend who was putting together the art exhibit, a guy named Chris Melisinos, um, just another person I had known in the game business for many years. And uh, he asked me if he could interview me for the, uh, so, so he was building a, 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 he was curating is the fancy word for it, uh, an exhibit to run at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. It would be the kind of the most important uh, museum exhibit ever in, uh, certainly in this country uh, for video games um, and it's kind of a retrospective on all things video gaming um, and you know hundreds of games in it on all these different platforms really really a cool project and he asked me if he could interview me for it because I had at that point had a long history in the game business and um, which I agreed to and um and, and one of the things he asked me is, you know, he knew about Halo 2600. He asked me if he could include it in the exhibit as an example of homebrew, because um, he wanted to have, you know, something that was homebrew. So why not that? Um, and uh, I agreed to that. So anyway, the, 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 you know, the exhibit opens at the Smithsonian. I get to go to the opening ceremony, which was really cool. Um, and uh, people love the exhibit. Tons of people come to see it. And um, they, had the, they had a curator at the museum who was in charge of things that, had, that were sort of technology based. Um, and uh, he was thinking maybe they should add some video games to their permanent collection, which they didn't have at that point. Um, so he went through the exhibit and he picked a couple things that, um, that caught his eye. And one of them was Flower by that game company, which I think is an excellent choice and deserves to be in a museum. <laughs> and the and the other the other game that he picked at that time um, was uh, was my game. Uh, and um, I think that he liked just the concept of a demake, the idea that you would try to take a game backwards through time and still have it sort of read like the the original game you know that somebody who played the modern halo would recognize halo in this in this earlier version um but i i don't really know for sure but um but he approached me and asked if they could add it to the permanent collection and i said sure why not <laughs> and um yeah and that was um how it, it went in later uh one of ian bogos games that's something called a slow year mm -hmm. that he did uh, also got added to the collection which was nice so that's a lovely game it is it is so there's actually 
at least two Atari 2600 games in the collection. <laughs> nice. And did you do another 2600 game? I Yeah, I did some other stuff on the 2600. Um, uh, I did... Um, I did a demo for a demo scene uh, competition <laughs> just for fun. Um, and I, so I, did, I wrote a 128 byte Atari 2600 game called, not game, uh, demo called Drip. And it basically uh, does graphics on the screen and uh, plays uh, interesting computer music all in 128 bytes. Um, and um, you, can find, you can find videos of it out there and, even the code if you want. Uh, 128 bytes is not a lot of code on the 2600. It's, it's actually really hard just to draw a stable screen in that in that few bytes. I had to kind of combine multiple routines together. Uh, uh, so it, it's actually pretty cleverly written how it does music and graphics uh, without having any real data. Um, but anyway, so I did that. And then I went on and I did a... Um, I did a copy of Rally X, um, and I never really finished Rally X. I kind of got distracted with other stuff, <laughs> like, like you can see I sometimes do. <laughs> uh, so, but there's a there's a quite playable version of Rally X, which there wasn't before. Uh, probably four or five people had tried to write Rally X and hadn't and hadn't succeeded. And so I just wanted to kind of show that it was possible. And um, you know, it has three levels you can play through, and um, it's it, it's. The work in progress, it, you know, as, as they call them, uh, is pretty finished, but it was never, never officially released. Um, so since you've done games in, in the, the super extremely difficult mode of Atari 2600, ha have you ever felt compelled to go back to your roots on the 800 and do something new there? Not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I never know what I'll, I'm going to get excited about. I have an 800 right over there that works. Um, uh, still play Mule every once in a while with buddies of mine, which would be my favorite uh, Atari 800 game, Mule. Uh, it's a masterpiece. Um, I don't know. Right now, you know, I've been, I've been more into the arcade thing. Um, uh, and, you know, these machines are all super interesting. And it, it sounds like you've looked at my blog, but... To me, it was just interesting. Wow, how can you make a game with no code at all? I mean, I mean, I guess the 2600 got me open my eyes to what was possible, you know, at the extremes of, but it, you know, it at least has a microprocessor. The, none of these machines you see behind me even have a mi microprocessor. So how do they work? And that's really what my blog is about: is like kind of discovering how machines like Computer Space, and and others work. Um, and you know now I mean kind of even earlier with like the the, the PDP eight and the PDP eleven and and exploring that that area and just trying to understand it better and you know every once in a while I discover something that's missing or that people haven't written about try to try to preserve that history I guess nice something I forgot to ask you on when we we're talking about Atari hundred stuff was uh, Key Punch Software's arcade bonanza which had three games in it, which apparently you didn't authorize. <laughs> no, I didn't know anything about that. Somebody, somebody told me about that a few years ago. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't know anything about it at all. Wow. Seems like an upstanding company. But I mean, I guess if, you, if, if you'd accept 5% royalties, you probably would accept 0% royalties. Um, you, you know, my, deal, my Halo 2600 deal is not much different than that. So yeah. <laughs> I was happy to see... Uh, David uh, Crane and the Kitchen Brothers uh, just announced a new uh, company to make Atari 2600 games. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah. For the Audacity Games, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they have good good luck with that. I mean, there's, I don't know, I don't know what they're, what they're hoping for, but I mean, there's there's a market there, but it's not a big market. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. I I felt the same way. Yeah. I don't. I hope they don't think they're going to get rich. But um, but I, if they're doing it to, for the fans, I mean, it's been amazing stuff coming out on the 2600. I mean, um, a lot of it, you know, people are cheating from my point of view because they're using <laughs> the DPC plus stuff with the. I mean, they basically have an ARM chip in a cartridge and 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 bypass all the, you know, I mean, you, you can compile C and run it on this uh, cartridge and then have it just use the 2600 as a graphical output, basically. Hmm. 
give yourself way more memory, faster processor, all this stuff. So oh, so you uh, can you could do literally anything, and all you have the twenty six hundred is only in charge of putting pixels up, and that's it. Exactly, oh, that is cheating. I, I mean, you know, I mean, it's brilliant, it's, but <laughs> yeah, it's you know, and 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 they would probably argue, well, people did that back in the day too, and it's true. Like Pitfall Two had its own little coprocessor to do make it sound better and stuff like that, and of course, bank switching things like that, but you know, whatever. I mean, everybody has their own reasons they want to go work on these old machines. You know, for me, for me, my reason is I, I guess I want to feel what it was like back in the day to work on that kind of machine. So, you know, um, living within the constraints of that machine, I think are, is interesting. But if your only goal is to make the best possible game on that hardware, you know, that's a way to do it. You know, what they're doing is a way to do it. Um, We've gone from a world where literally one guy could make a game in his college dorm to a world where you need to have a venture fund in order to fu <laughs> fund developers' teams to, to, to make a game. Yeah. Is it better, worse, or just different? Well, I think it was getting worse, and now it's getting better, actually. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, let's, let's go back like 10 years ago. Um, the teams were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm talking like teams of hundreds of people. Budgets were getting 50, 100 million, 200 million, 500 million. I mean, there are games like that. Um, you know, Bungie was down the street from me. They, they have about 1,000 employees um, uh, for one game. <laughs> you know, it's this kind of mind boggling. Um, but what really started to change, you know, in this last decade was, uh, digital distribution became possible, which meant it kind of broke the, you know, chokehold that, uh, a small set of publishers had on, on getting games and out to the market. And, you know, when games had to be in boxes, they sort of had to sell for a certain price or it wasn't worth putting them in a box and, and shipping them to stores. And, um, and they, you know, it just, it just became, it, it was just a place where you couldn't experiment anymore, you know, where you couldn't have a small team make a game. You know, iPhone came out. That was a huge thing that started to change things. 2007, um, Steam becoming popular and, and then opening up the Steam uh, catalog, basically, so anybody could put something in Steam. Um, and, then, and then, of course, now even the consoles are, have digital distribution, although they're still not anybody can just put their game on Xbox, um, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, so so now you you're back to where there are small teams doing interesting stuff. Certainly, there's one person teams making mobile games um, and making a living doing it. And um, and sometimes even you know games we know well aren't that big. You know, Slay the Spire. Or, I don't know how big the Among Us team was, but they were pretty small. Um, you know, there's a few other small developers around here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's popular Steam games that are made by a single person today. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think that's great. I think we're we've got a kind of gone back to the future in, in that we we have a market situation where. Um, Teams can be whatever size and pick whatever ambition they want to their games, um, and they and still be supported, and be successful. What haven't I asked you about the Atari days that I should have? Hmm, that's a tricky question. Hmm, I'll tell you a, a funny story. Well, I don't know if it's funny, but I'll tell you one quick story that I don't tell very often. But um, so when I went to college. Um, I got there like the day before classes were going to start and my trunk hadn't arrived yet. I shipped a trunk that had uh, like my, my monitor, my, my actually little TV in it and some other stuff and that hadn't arrived. So I just had my Atari 800, um, just the main unit. Um, and one of the other things I didn't have was I didn't have an alarm clock. And I didn't have a roommate because my roommate hadn't showed up yet. And I knew I had to get up the next day for class. And so, um, so I decided I would write a program in basic without a screen. <laughs> 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 I 
to uh, set off an alarm, you know, to wake me up in the morning. And, um, and I wrote the program um, and it worked and it went off the next morning as it was supposed to and woke me up. So that's, that's my challenge to Atari programmers out there is uh, to write a no screen, uh, no look uh, <laughs> alarm program on their Atari. Uh, I'm sure there are many today who could do it. But. Nice, awesome. All right, I think this is my last question then. Um, if you could send a message to the people who are still using their Atari computers today, and you can right now, what would you tell them? I, I love that people are like that out there. You know, um, I've, I've spoken at a bunch of different conferences over the years, been able to see really like Portland Retro Gaming Expo, for example, you know, when I first spoke there, it was, you know, kind of in, the, in, in a few rooms in a hotel and now it's the Portland Convention Center and you can walk through this giant area. Mm -hmm. um, and it, to me, it's been amazing to see the growth of that stuff. And, you know, as somebody who worked back in the day to see that there's still people around 40 years later who care about something, a, you know, a kid did, uh, you know, in the basement uh, is, is incredibly um, fun for me. And it, you know, makes me want to, you know, continue to go and speak at events like that and continue to mess around with this stuff. I'm always surprised how much attention I get when I do something, you know, Halo 2600, I didn't think anyone would really care, <laughs> but now it's in a museum, who knows? Um, so, um, so I, I just, I just, I'm just really appreciative that there's fans out there and that there's people who are rediscovering these machines and why they're fun. And, you know, that it's not just, just thrown away, like, oh, an old piece of technology that doesn't matter anymore. That's been replaced with a slicker, faster, faster machine. I think these, they were really remarkable, remarkable machines that changed the world. And, um, uh, I'm glad that people are still remembering them and documenting, documenting them. <laughs>